Hallelujah. Let us give a round of applause for our Gabriel Choir. Now today was as hot as the summer. Now that the weather is getting warmer and by the grace of God, the pandemic is also getting better so that we can, and I believe that the day we, where we can gather and even have fellowship will come near. So I pray that the act of revivalism will once again be upon this church. Now today, I would like to take the message from Luke chapter 17, verses 28 to 33, and share a message titled, Just Like the Days of Lot. Just Like the Days of Lot. Because if you look in today's text, Jesus spoke about the end times, and he said that the coming of Christ will be just like the days of Noah. And in the book of Luke, says that it will be like the days of Lot. So the coming of Christ speaks of Jesus' return and judgment. So Jesus' return and judgment will be like the days of Noah and Lot. So if we study about the days of Noah and Lot, then we can prepare well for the coming judgment. So today, we're going to learn about the days of Lot. So number one, what kind of place was Saddam? What kind of place was Saddam? Now, Saddam was located in the southeast of the Dead Sea. Southeast of the Dead Sea. Now, that, that is the Galilee. There's the Jordan River and then the Dead Sea, right? What he's writing right now is Canaan. So Saddam, it was about there. So Saddam and Gomorrah. So where it circled is what we're talking about, the southeast of Dead Sea. It was in the Valley of Jordan, which was very fertile. So when Lot separated from Abraham, he scanned the land and saw this and said that this is a place that was very fertile. It had a lot of water, which is the reason why he chose that land. So it's a good place to live visibly, physically, right? So Lot separated from Abraham and moved to Saddam, and that was around 2083 BC, we can estimate. It was around 2083 BC. Because this was when Abraham also went from Paris, to, uh, I'm sorry, went to um, Haran. Now, both went, were in Egypt and they were living and, you know, they had a lot of livestock. And because of the amount of livestock, they couldn't live together. So Abraham gave Lot a chance to choose the land. So that's where they separated. So that was around uh, about um, 2083 B.C. So when Saddam was judged, that is recorded in Genesis chapter 19. So we're going to look into that too. But if you look at Genesis chapter 19, when Saddam was being judged was when Abraham was 99 years old. So that was 2067 B.C. How do we know that Abraham was 99 years old? Because Genesis chapter 19 is related to chapter 18. So you need to read those two chapters together. What happened was that three men came up to Abraham, one of which was God, and two were angels. So they came and they said two major things. Number one was the fact that Isaac will be born next time this uh, next year about this time. So because Abraham was 100 years old when he gave birth, Abraham was 99 years old when this was told to him. And the second one was that the fact that Saddam will be judged, and he was told this because of Lot. So Abraham made a deal with God about the 50, 40, 30, even down to 10 people. If there are 10 righteous men, would you, would you judge the land? And God said no. 
which meant that there were not even ten righteous men. And then if you look at Genesis chapter 19, the two angels went down to Saddam. That's how everything's related. So this Saddam was demolished in 2067 BC. It was judged. So spiritually, what type of place was Saddam? Let's turn to Revelation chapter 11, verse 8. Revelation chapter 11, verse 8. And their bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which mystically is called Saddam and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified, right? So here, the great city is Babylon that's recorded in Revelations. But that great city, Babylon, is mystically called Saddam and Egypt, which is also where their Lord was crucified. So it says in Genesis 19 that when the angels were invited into Lot's house, the people outside called out saying, where are the men that, you, that came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we may have relations with them. So relations is yada. It indicates the, the relationship with, between a, a husband and a wife. But these men outside wanted to have relations with the two angels. And they were chanting uh, this to Lot. And then Sodom, uh, Sodom's sin is also the sin of pride. In Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49, the following, it says, Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had arrogance, abundant food, and careless ease, that she did not help the poor and needy. So here, it says abundant food. It had careless ease, but she did not help the poor and needy. Thus, they were haughty and committed abominations before me. So Sodom was haughty, committed abomination, and then because of his abundant food, did not help the poor and needy. So it's the same for us. If we, when pe the people are abundant, uh, when they're plenty, then they will sin more before God. And that is why you need to be even more awake and consume the word even more. And number two, we're going to look into the identity of the two angels. The two angels who came to Sodom, as I mentioned before, in order to understand Genesis 19, we need to look into Genesis 18. So in Genesis 18, verse 1 and 2, it says that the Lord appeared to Abraham. 
And then in verse 2, it says, When Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, behold, three men were standing opposite him. In verse 1, it says that God appeared to him. But in verse 2, when he lifted up his eyes, he saw three. And in Genesis chapter 18, verse 22, it says, Then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom. Right? While Abraham was still standing before the Lord. So the three men came, two of them went to Sodom, and Abraham was standing before God. So he is mediating for Lot. And then Genesis chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening. So the eight, chapter 18, it was the three, it was the two men, but in 19, it says two angels. It's the same. And because it says angels here, people think of people with, you know, men with wings, but that's not it. In Hebrew, angels here is the word malach. Malach. Angels in Hebrew is malach, which originally means messenger. It's the one who delivers something. So angel here. Is indicating someone who is delivering God's message and God's will. Or the one who is doing work for God is the word malak. So, of course, there are the angels with the wings, but many angels in the Bible appear as men. So, you and I, if we have been sent by God, then we are the malak, we're the angels. So these two angels were men. So how can we understand these two angels? These two angels came to Sodom to save and to judge. It was, they were there to save Lot and his family while they were there to judge the rest of the, uh, the city of Sodom. So these two angels and revelations remind us of the two witnesses the two witnesses in revelation in revelation chapter 11 there are the two witnesses that appear revelation chapter 11 verses 3 to 4 and i will grant authority to my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the lord of the earth so here, it says the two witnesses are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. The lampstands indicates the church. So the two witnesses are, it's not exactly physically two men because the number two indicates the number of, uh, of witness. So it's symbolic. So the two witnesses, rather than indicating two men, it symbolizes the last church that will stand before God. So if we go back to Genesis 19, the two angels were before God, right? These were the two people who were serving God. They received the command, the word of God, and these two men went. So these were like the two witnesses. Yeah, the two witnesses indicates the church, the believers. And in Revelation chapter 10, in Revelation chapter 10, there's the strong angel that came with the open book. The book indicates the Bible because before this book was closed, it was sealed. But the second coming Remove the seal and he opened the book, meaning that all these words have been, have been opened. And that book was provided to Apostle John and he fed him the word. So Apostle John ate it and he was told to prophesy the word, prophecy the word. And in verse uh, chapter 11, the two witnesses appeared and they will, pro they pro will prophesy for two, uh, 1260 days. So the 
so Apostle John is he's a representative essentially of the two witnesses. So overall, this is what it means. The one who've been provided the open book to eat it are the one, are the witnesses. To those who received the open book and who's been fed the open book and was were told to prophesy the word are the two witnesses. So even the two angels, they received this command from God and went down to Sodom. So these were the two angels, and these were the two witnesses. Now, what did these two witnesses do? They were sent to measure. So they were measuring something. Measuring is an act of judgment and salvation. So when you're measuring something, weighing something, if it is enough, then it's salvation. If it is lacking in weight, then it's judgment. So in Gen it's, it's, it's the same as what they do in Genesis chapter 19 with the two angels. And also these two witnesses will proclaim the final word during the first three and a half years. Because once they are done proclaiming, then the word of the three and a half, first three and a half years will end. So they proclaim the final words. And likewise, the two angels at, Saddam, at Sodom, they proclaim the final word before Sodom's demise. Because they will prophesy the word, prophesy the word, and that city will end. So these two angels were not only the two witnesses in Revelation, but they also remind us of the two spies sent to Jericho. The two spies. So in order to control, um, conquer Jericho, Rahab. Um, uh, Rahab accepts these two spies, right? Yeah, the two spies were sent to destroy Jericho. That was their purpose. And here we see Lot and Rahab. These two risked their lives in order to save the, the two angels, the two spies. And that's how they were saved. We mentioned in Genesis chapter 19, verse 5, how the people of Sodom told, uh, were shouting to bring them out, that we want to have relations with them. But Lot, he blocked them, and he c was committed to even releasing two of his uh, daughters. And even with Rahab, in Joshua chapter 2, verse 3, And the king of Jericho sent word to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house. Right? It's the same word in Hebrew. For they have come to search out all the land. So here, Rahab, she lied by saying that they, were, uh, they already left. And therefore, their lives were saved. Now, if the king would have found out, then these men would have been killed. So Lot and Rahab, both, they didn't lose, forget about their hospitality. So Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1 and 2, and verse 2 especially, it says, that do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. So Lot, he was trying to block the people, but because they were being so aggressive, the angels, um, he, they took Lot in, they closed the door. Now what happened was in uh, chapter 19, verse 11, it says that they... Uh, they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, with blindness, and so that they weary themselves selves trying to find the doorway. Yeah, the fact that there was blindness involved is in, is recorded only twice in the Bible. It's here in Genesis, and also in Second Kings chapter six, verse nineteen. In Second Kings chapter six, it was. Now, it is also to physically make people blind, but it was also spiritually to make them blind. So the fact, it, it, the, the focus here is the fact that they could not find the doorway because this was the doorway of salvation. What, where the two angels were was the place of salvation, but the angels made sure that the people couldn't find the doorway. 
Now, the people of Sodom, they could not. It's not that they were trying to find the doorway to salvation. It was that they were trying to find the doorway to satisfy themselves. So the angels, they blinded them. And it's the same for Jesus' time also. In John chapter 12, verse 40, it says, He has blinded their eyes, and he hardened their hearts, so that they would not see with their eyes and perceive with their heart, and be converted, and I heal them. Jesus performed so many miracles, and because they didn't believe, this is what he said during the Passion Week, that he furthered their eyes to make sure that they would not be able to turn back and repent, to make sure that they would not enter the doorway of salvation, because Jesus is the door of salvation. If they're blinded, then they would not be able to find that door. So when they're spiritually blind, they cannot see Jesus or believe in him. So in the Bible, to be blind is the start of judgment. After the people of Sodom were blinded, the two angels told Lot the reason for their visit. And that's in Genesis chapter 19, verses 12 to 13. Then the two men said to Lot, Whom else have you here? A son-in-law, and your sons and your daughters, and whomever you have in the city, bring them out of the place. For we are about to destroy this place, because their outcry has become so great before the Lord that the Lord has sent us to destroy it. We've come here to destroy the city. And then he says, he says, bring them out of the place, whomever you have in the city. Now Lot, is he being saved because of his deeds? Of course, in 2 Peter 2, verse 7, they call him the righteous Lot. Yes, they did call him that. But was Lot being saved because of his deeds? No. Because in the Bible, the Bible specifically states that Lot is being saved because of Abraham. In Genesis chapter 19, verse 29. So Lot was a man who was saved because of someone else. But today, even for you and I, it's the same thing. We are all, no, no, no one here is worthy of being saved due to our individual deeds. We're being saved because of someone else. And who is that? That's Jesus. Because Jesus has gifted us with his righteousness, we can be saved. So Lot is actually the footprint of a Christian. So it is truly graceful because we've done nothing. Now, we're going to see how great God's grace is. Lot was being saved because of Abraham. And now angels were saying to Lot, bring everyone you know, that everyone that you know in the city. So that grace is being offered to everyone in the city, is including his, his son-in-law whom he has no connection to. He doesn't share any blood with his son-in-law. Now, the son-in-laws are probably people of Sodom. And the son-in-laws probably don't even know about Abraham. But the angels were saying, do you have son-in-law? Bring them. It is an enormous grace. It, they're, being, they're being given the invitation to salvation. And that was provided to everyone in the city. But the problem was, here, Lot went up to the uh, the son-in-laws and told them in Genesis chapter 19 verse 14 it says Lot went out and spoke to his son-in-law who were to marry his daughter up get out of this place for the Lord will destroy the city but he appeared to his son-in-laws sons-in-law to be jesting jesting uh, kidding it means in Hebrew is chahak chahak what this means is to laugh. The word laugh was where the word Isaac was derived. Because Isaac is Ichak. Why was he named that? God told um, God told Sarah that she would have a baby and Sarah laughed. So it indicates disobedience, right? Disbelief. 
But here, it chahak means that they continuously laughed and derided Lot for what he said. So they were considering their father-in-law to be crazy. They were making fun of him. So what we can learn from this is that if there is a believer, to the believers, to everyone who surrounds that believer, will be provided the chance of salvation. That is what God has provided. But if there is no training in the Word, right? Even if the people surrounding people are provided the opportunity, they will not know. They will not hold on to that opportunity. Same with the the sons-in-law. They were provided the opportunity, but they rejected it. Which is why we have to provide the word of God to us, to our children, and everyone around us. And we need to receive the word every day and to be awake with the word. Now, even Lot, who grew up under Abraham, in Genesis chapter nineteen, verse sixteen, it says that when the angels tried to take Lot, Lot delayed. The angels were saying, "Let's go," but he hesitated. It says actually. Now Lot probably lived in Sodom for sixteen to twenty years, meaning that he was apart from the word for so long. So of course he was hesitant. Not only that, Jesus told, uh, to, um, also said to remember his wife. So it says here. When morning dawned, that the angels woke up Lot. So before sunrise, they woke Lot up to leave, but he hesitated. So they they forced him to leave the wife and the two daughters outside of the city. So they were brought out of the city. So that is truly God's grace. So he he brought them out with these uncontrollable grace. And they were told to run to the mountain, and Lot was saying that it was too far away. So eventually, they made a deal, and was told to go to the land of、uh, to another land. But on their way, Lot's wife turned and became the became a pillar of salt. So in Luke chapter seventeen, verse thirty-one and thirty-two, it says, "On that day, the one who is on the housetop and whose go- whose goods are in the house must not go down to take them out, and likewise the one who is in the field must not turn back." Remember Lot's wife. It means that Lot's wife did exactly this, the word that we just read in Luke chapter seventeen, saying, "The goods in the house." You know, my beloved house, my beloved Sodom, my beloved items. This is my home. So she couldn't leave that. Although her body left by force, her heart was still in Sodom. It was like the first generation of the Israelites after they left Egypt. They continuously complained, and what they said was that they wanted to return back to Egypt. And eventually, they all died in Egypt,、uh, in the wilderness. And likewise, Lot's wife died in the field. Abraham's father Terah couldn't go to Canaan, and he delayed in Haran and died there. So Haran, Egypt, the field, all represents the church. It is with the fire of God's grace that He has brought us out to the church. Now it's from here that we need to mature, and go up to the mountain. That is what we have to do. But there will be people who will not be able to make it. So the angels originally commanded for them to escape to the mountain. So it was one. It's a singular tense. It's not. Just any mountain that they should escape to. It was there was a destined destined、um, mountain. So Jesus also said that、um, to those who are in Judea for the mountain. Now, th- what is this mountain? In Isaiah chapter twenty-five. It says, "The Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples on this mountain, a banquet of aged wine, choice pieces with marrow and refined." Aged wine, 
right? And then it says in verse 7, And on this mountain he will swallow up the covering which is over all peoples, even the veil which is stretched over all nations. He will swallow up death for all time, and the Lord God will wipe tears away from all faces, and he will remove the reproach of his people from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. So he will swallow up death, he will wipe away tears, and he will remove reproach. So this is Mount Zion, the new Jerusalem. It is the greatest mountain. So we need to believe in this and march forward. But I see something like this, and I, I also cast out. And if you cast out like what Lot did, then you will just end up going to a random place. But you shouldn't do that. If God is telling you to go somewhere, he's telling you to go to that place because it's possible. He will give you grace to make sure that you can do it. Now, lastly, why was righteous Lot in the place of judgment? Why was he in Sodom? The first reason was because he left the source of blessings, which was Abraham. He left the source of blessings, which was Abraham. Right? Abraham is a source of blessing. Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. Right? Abraham was a source of blessing, but because of his physical, physical vision, he left. Number two, he left the promised land. It's the same word. Because in the promised land is Abraham. So why did he leave? As I mentioned before, it was because of his greed. And also... Um, the delight of the eyes. In Genesis chapter 13, verse 10, Lot lifted up his eyes and saw the valley of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go to Zoar. So visually, Sodom was as beautiful as the garden of Eden. So he saw that and fell for it. That's why he went. It was as um, it was recorded in Genesis chapter 3 verse 6. Before the fall, Adam saw the tree of the knowledge of good and evil as the fact that it was good to eat and it was good to see. And that is why he reached out and ate from it. It's the same thing. So in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. So it says here, the lust of the eyes. If you follow what you see, then you will leave the Father. So you should not live according to your vision. You have to live according to your faith. So Job, although he left Abraham, the promised land, the world, the word, it, the grace of God was too great because of Abraham that he, law was still saved. And that's recorded in Genesis. So he was eventually saved. And he was saved and was told to go to that mountain. But Lot was saying that it was too far away and he was tired so he couldn't go. But look at what the angel said. So after they were approved to go to Zor, it says, hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the town was called Zor, which means that Lot, until he arrived somewhere safe, that they would not create judgment, that they would hold on to the judgment. So he could have then said, 
Yeah, then I could go up to the mountain if they were able to hold everything back. But he didn't do that because he was too tired. It was too far away. But for you and I, that mountain may seem far away. It may be hard to climb. And it may be, you may not be convinced that you could go up there. But you just have to say amen and go. And he will give you the grace so that you can go up that mountain. Now, because God has already prepared to uh, save Lot, he was determined to even hold back judgment for him, but he didn't do it because he was tired. So please believe in God's patience and his grace. And I hope you say amen to that. And I pray that even though it may be strenuous, I pray that we all will go up to the top of the mountain. Let us not be like Lot. But from now on, let us focus even more on the prayer and the word. And let us even be, grow stronger so that we can eventually go to on top of Mount Zion. I pray this upon you in the name of the Lord. Let us pray. Our Father God of love and grace, we truly thank you at this time. By your grace, we learned about Lot. And we learned as to where it is that we need to go. And we truly thank you for that. With our physical eyes, that place may seem far away. That place may be impossible to go. It, we may cast doubt in terms of going. But I pray that you will help us to say amen and have the courage to go. And may we also believe in your promise that you made to us, that you will be with us as we carry each of our footsteps towards that mountain. And I pray that you will guide us for that to happen. And as we go forward with your word, please grant the wings of the eagle. And with that, may we all be able to arrive to the top of mountain and to the children that you've granted. Please may we be able to train them and nurture them with your word. May they not be like the sons-in-law of Lot, but when they are provided the word, may we all be able to say amen. And with a grateful heart, we would like to give you offering at this time. Please remember all those giving you offering. And please open up the gates to heaven and repay them back. Wherever this offering is used, may it only be used for your glorious purposes. And in all this, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray in thanksgiving. Amen. Let us give glory to our God.